Okay. Welcome to today's Between Two Bookshelves webinar on how to advocate for humanities departments to senior administrators. I'm Stephen Kidd, Executive Director of the National Humanities Alliance. Today's webinar is part of NHA's study, the Humanities Initiative, which with the generous support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, supports faculty and administrators in making the case for the value of studying the humanities as an undergraduate. Please visit nhalliance.org and studythehumanities.org to learn more about the initiative. In the coming months, we'll be sharing a report on effective humanities recruitment strategies gleaned from our humanities recruitment survey of nearly 300 higher ed institutions. We invite you to reach out to us regarding efforts on your campus to promote undergraduate humanities education. Our topic today is particularly timely. Since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis and the related financial strains on higher ed institutions, concerns have grown around the potential downsizing, consolidation, and elimination of humanities departments. So to help support departments that may be facing these challenges, as well as those that are looking to advocate for new programs, we'll talk today about how to make the case for humanities departments to deans and provosts. We're delighted to have one current and two former senior administrators who are also humanities scholars and members of the NHA Board of Directors join us today. I'm pleased to introduce Joy Conley, President of the American Council of Learned Societies and former Interim President and Provost of the Graduate Center at CUNY and former Dean for Humanities at NYU. Paula Krebs, Executive Director of the Modern Language Association and former Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Bridgewater State University and former department chair at Wheaton College. And Ben Vincent, Provost of Case Western Reserve University and former Dean of George Washington University's Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. This is intended to be a nuts and bolts discussion. So I'll set our conversation up by asking our panelists some questions and then I'll provide time for the specific questions that you may have. Thanks so much for the to the three of you for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, together, you have experience with liberal arts colleges, regional comprehensive universities, and public and private R1s. So we hope to be able to explore differences and similarities across a range of contexts. So, Department chairs regularly interact with deans and provosts, not just during times of crisis surrounding budget cuts and restructuring plans. So we definitely want to get into some specific advice for dealing with moments of crisis. But first, I'd like to ask you all about a rosier scenario. Suppose a department wants a new program or position or additional funding for an existing program. How should they make the case for the resources they need? Let's start with Ben. What advice do you have for a department chair advocating to their dean or provost for resources for their new idea? Steve, first of all, let me just reiterate how much of a pleasure it is to speak with you and the audience today. Uh, I'm glad you started with that rosy scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because look, this advocacy work is really hard and it's even harder right now in this particular environment. Um, and so amid the bed of roses, let me, let me just look at those thorns a little bit because I think we need to, we need to see those for what they are. Um, you know, the reality out there, Stephen, is that look, about half of provosts and particularly those those in the AAU, you know, they've got degrees in STEM fields. Uh, and this is true, too, of a lot of the uh, emerging deans of colleges of arts and sciences. And, and they, if, they, if they're not in STEM fields per se, they're in the social sciences, uh, like 
like uh, that are closely related, like the psychological sciences. The bulk of STEM uh, of the STEM provosts, in fact, are engineers. Um, and look, we know what, what's what's happening in terms of the conversations that are taking place it, at both public and private colleges. Provosts believe uh, that liberal arts education is on the decline. And when you look at the statistics, and Inside Higher Ed has recently done some good research on this, you know, 46% of public university provosts uh, believe this, and that's up from 32% just a year ago. Uh, and in private institutions, the number's even higher. 55% is the, is the number that have that lack of confidence in the, the future of liberal arts education, up from 43%. When you combine all of this with what's happening with, with COVID, uh, the painful cuts that have been taking place, uh, the resource allocation game, STEM and professional schools we know are, are starting to uh, feel a little bit more uh, favor. This is the environment in which this bed of roses it, uh, it, it exists. But not all is lost. There's some daylight in this. Look, in the same, uh, Inside Higher Ed has also done some good research and found that at least eight in 10 provosts believe that uh, the concept of a liberal arts education is not understood here in the United States fully. And that's even though 87% believe that a liberal arts education is crucial to an undergraduate education. I think that you got to pause on that. So despite the STEM fields, despite all of this preponderance uh, of uh, a kind of a, what would be an, a march away from the humanities, there is a belief in the core that this is still the critical element to an education. And three quarters of provosts are concerned, uh, uh, concerned about the trend of shutting down departments. So this is, this is where we can build uh, and start now to, to plant those roses a little bit more fully, Stephen. So what can you do specifically? What can you do? First of all, play ball. Figure out the best ways that you can align with STEM fields and present your programs as an added element to what's being trying to be accomplished in STEM. We've been hearing a lot about STEM plus. That's a valuable crease for humanities uh, 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 advocates to move in. Um, uh, figure out how to actually teach to those concerns in terms of uh, there's people are, uh, we're hearing a lot about companies that, that are also wanting to hire uh, for more than technical competence. Uh, and so for more than what STEM actually trains for. This again, we all know this, but we actually can do more to actually do this. And so whatever you're, you're trying to advocate for, if you can work and play ball within this, within this STEM framework and the STEM plus framework, you will be an indispensable asset. Take advantage of online. This is a real opportunity to boost pedagogy and program and department value at any university or college. And I don't see this diminishing at any time in the near future. So dive in, encourage others in your fields to do so. This can give you critical leverage. Think diversity. Look, I think this is pretty clear. Diversity matters and even more so in this day and age given what's happening with our social reckoning. Don't pay it lip service, make it a main course. Figure out how to add it in, in, into what you're doing. It will help your case. And finally, do your homework. Administrators are scholars too. Respectful, be respectful. Don't forget that many administrators in academe prove themselves in the lab, in the classroom, in their publications. They are colleagues wearing a different hat, but they are still colleagues. So I, I think these are, this is one of the ways this garden can start to grow, Stephen. Great. Paula, what, uh, what advice would you have? So, first of all, I, my experience is at a liberal arts institution and as a dean of humanities and social sciences in a regional comprehensive. And that means that in my experience, there were no clear institutional mechanisms for crossing over to, to the, get some of those goodies that the College of, of Science and Math had. Um, my advocacy came straight from the humanities and social sciences to the provost's office. And, and, and so occasionally I would propose uh, joint programs with the sciences, but I'm not a, I was never at a case Western, you know, I was never at a school for, you know, that even had engineering, you know, uh, let alone that it was a priority there. So what I would advise my chairs to do um, was to align with the strategic priorities of the institution. And that is part of the doing your homework that Ben is talking about, is to say, okay, 
Um, look at what the strategic plan says. It's right up there on the website. Um, look at what you've ident your institution has identified as its strategic priorities. Uh, depending on how good the strategic planning website is, it may, it may divide it down into individual initiatives. It may track the success. Um, but when you align with what your top administrators have indicated are the priorities of the institution, you are much more likely to get funded uh, to pursue the thing that you want to pursue. So I would always go back to my chairs and say, you know, this makes perfect sense within the context of your discipline, but where does it fit with, within the context of this institution and its goals, its role in the community, you know, as a regional comprehensive institution, for example, how does it serve uh, the population of the area, what you want to do? Um, how does it fit with the, the priorities uh, for hiring uh, in, in area businesses? How does it line up with this institution as part of its larger community, as well as this college as part of the larger institution, your department as part of this college, and then as part of the institution? So there are layers uh, I had to encourage deans or, or uh, chairs to think about um, because let's face it, chairs are faculty members. Faculty members are taught to think in their disciplines um, and to think of themselves in their disciplines in relation to either their teaching or their research. And they're not necessarily, well, they're not chairs. None of us was trained uh, as an academic to be an administrator. That's on the job training, that is. So your chairs, um, uh, your your deans don't expect that you have that kind of institutional uh, perspective necessarily. And it's their job as, as good deans to train you to think that way. But if they haven't done that, then you have to train yourself to think that way, uh, to, uh, to use the documents that are available to you uh, and, and to look at the speeches that your president is making, to look at what your board of trustees uh, minutes are saying and line yourself up with those. And I'm not saying morally compromise. I know I'm not saying create programs that you don't believe in because you think they'll get funded. I'm saying if you want to create something that, that attracts more um, first generation Pell Grant recipient students of color into your major, well, and your institution, for example, really is prioritizing uh, outreach to community colleges in your region, then that's the framework that you can use to increase those enrollments, but, but identify what the priorities are of the institution. I guess that's what I would say. Great, great. And George? Yeah, these are, thank you again, Steve, for having me and, and thanks to everyone for coming. And these are, Ben and, ben and Paula, uh, these are great, uh, great pieces of advice. I would say a few things. I and mean, first, be proactive. I mean, really to get to the nitty gritty, ask for meetings with the dean right away as soon as you become chair or as soon as the, you know, the summer, uh, the, uh, actually as, the, as soon as the summer starts, you know, get on the calendar. And, and I'll say deans worry that all the time that their messages aren't getting across to the faculty and, and graduate students, if that's relevant in your school. Um, we all know how quickly faculty hit the delete button we, you know, on admin emails, we've all been there. So it, that's an easy and harmless way to make yourself an ally, to simply commit, to say, you know, uh, I'm here to, to help you get the message out, may or may not advocate, you don't have to go into that detail, but. Um, but to commit to improving the flow of communication about the priorities of the school and how the department is going to fit into that um, is, is a harmless and helpful thing for, for the dean to hear. Uh, I would say the, um, it's an also, also a very good way strategically or tactically rather to set up your next meeting with the dean because then you, you can say uh, in, in your next email to the assistant or to the dean, uh, dean themselves, uh, okay, I've gone to my colleagues, we've talked about the plan for the school, I'm now ready to, I want to give you feedback. So you've set up a kind of non-confrontational, non-controversial line of conversation. Um, I guess three more things quickly that perform some understanding of the, of the pressures on the school, um, even if it's not directly relevant to your project. I mean, just show that it's not all about your department um, or your thing, that even if it's a drop like, oh, I read on, in, the, in the newspaper that, you know, the new, uh, the new green initiative is running into funding trouble. Gosh, that must be, you know, well, now let's turn to our conversation. But some performance of that, it just helps. I mean, the deans, as Ben said, they're, they're colleagues, they're people too, they're dealing with a lot, and that can help uh, establish a rapport. 
Um, and then the last two things, definitely be ready to negotiate. And that means come into the conversation with something you're ready to give up. Um, that might be painful when you've already experienced cuts, but, um, but think, try to think of it as an opportunity that you can volunteer to teach more in the undergraduate core curriculum or get involved in some initiative you know is, is useful to the dean. Um, so it doesn't mean necessarily give up in terms of fun, research funds or graduate lines or a search. It can be giving up maybe something you'd want to do, but, but putting the, the dean's priorities you know, somewhere in the mix. And, and lastly, I would say, um, don't be afraid of talking Joy. Both and I think some of my most frustrating uh, ideological or academic value uh, passions overtook the conversation and they couldn't, they, they simply refused to talk about, say, um, workforce competency or teaching of skills or I had one real fight with the chair. Think, uh, for years about um, putting stands, uh, just avoid them. <laughs> Great. Um, what about um, things to avoid? What are the mistakes that, that folks make sometimes? Um, let's start with Paula there. Up oh, your, you're muted, Paula. I, th I think that um, one of the it's it's already been implied by a lot of what we were talking about so that um, mistakes are focusing on say coverage in your field um, as a reason to advocate to a to a dean for a new line well we we in my own field we absolutely need an 18th century person you know because it's you know it's essential to cut you know if we're really going to cover uh, you know French literature we need an 18th century per that is not a convincing argument um, if anything that's insular in that, that way that's that's field specific um, is kind of doomed to failure beyond the department chair level you can make that case to your department chair but your department chair's uh, obligation is to make a larger case uh, to the dean or the provost ab above them so I would say thinking in uh, in discipline specific terms can be a problem for for advocating for programs that you want to uh, want to add or increase or uh, that's not the case with interdisciplinarity. So I'm not saying don't think about disciplines. Think about how your discipline connects to other disciplines or your department connects to other departments. That's, that's quite reasonable. But thinking in, in, in narrow uh, subdisciplinary terms can be a dead end uh, for, for growing up. I'll stop with that one. Yeah. Uh, ben or Joy, um, things sure. to avoid. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things I think we, we're, we're talking about some of those themes. One, uh, you know, as hearing both of my colleagues talk, uh, you know, being, making sure you don't fight the holy war, uh, you know, advocacy, this is not the Crusades. You know, uh, and I, I forget who, who said it here, but, you know, be ready to trade, negotiate, land in the middle rather than posing a holier than thou uh, attitude. All of this, all this does is to cause rifts between administrators and the faculty and um, creates frenemies out of friends. So you want to avoid that um, if possible. And you know, something else don't do, and I see this all the time, don't make it so complicated. You know, keep it simple. You know, complicated requests routinely get denied. Straight, simple, intelligible, you know, where, where you're showing the impact, where that's clear, you know, this tends to win the day. And, and you know, it can also, when you do this, you can, you can save some steps uh, uh, for your administrator by doing some homework, compiling data, reaching out to potential partners, um, that buttresses a request. So go ahead and do those things. If, if it's necessarily complicated, find the way to simplify it, bring in others to help, to help massage it. You know, the other thing I would say is just don't go rogue. Follow a chain of command. Nothing is worse to an administrator than being undercut. You know, you're going to lose the trust of those who can help you. And that trust may be, you may not get that trust back for the, for the, for the duration of that administrator's tenure. Um, and so, and depending on the administrator, there can even be consequences and you don't want to get into that. So, uh, um, so those are, those would be three don'ts, uh, from, from my perspective. 
Joy? Yeah, I think I saw in the chat that my internet connection briefly went out. So I'll, so I'll finish my sentence. I hope I, sorry about that. I didn't, I couldn't tell on my side. Um, I, I was saying, don't be afraid to talk both and. Um, and in particular, don't be afraid of, and, or, or don't dismiss, as, as Ben just said, don't, don't treat it as a holy war or a crusade. Uh, don't dismiss the, the talk of, which, which is all over administrators' desks, and, and the, it's, it, it really informs the questions of trustees and, frankly, the suspicions of trustees that faculty are out of touch with the real world and that they don't understand undergraduates are interested in jobs, their families are concerned about debt. So bearing all that in mind when you're confronted with, um, especially in the humanities, questions or suspicions maybe from a dean who's not a humanist or maybe who you feel has gone over to the dark side a bit, be prepared to speak the both and of, um, of the value of in, in whatever high-minded and social justice aspirational language you want to talk that that's right for you but but also do it both and also talk the language of um, preparation for the for for jobs um, meet the students where they are understanding what their concerns uh, what their concerns are and I'll just say lastly that uh, there really can be and I, I think partly and I hope this doesn't come off as a as a as a um, as a condescending statement, it's not at all meant that way. But I did feel as Dean that many faculty or chairs would walk into the office really nervous, I mean, deeply anxious and, and also doubly unsettled because these were sometimes senior scholars, very confident in their fields with a lot of authority and you know big major reputations. And suddenly they were on their back feet because they were inexperienced chairs, they were in situations that were, you know, that were new to them and their anxiety created a kind of puffed up arrogance or um, a puffed up um, sense of entitlement almost. You know, of course you have to do this for me, you know, with and, and a real um, anger and, and distress when they were asked to, to justify their arguments. So, so, you know, kind of, I would say I felt as a, as a um, before I became Dean, I was running a program, I would try to kind of just get a grip on myself before I walked into the office and I would think, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm a little nervous here. I want to get my arguments in order, um, kind of take a walk around the block. And, um, you know, I have to be ready for tough questions. And that's not, a, I, I shouldn't be insulted. Um, I'll, I'll probably be a little nervous. That's okay. So it's worth going through those kinds of, uh, of thought processes and, uh, and not to treat the whole affair as a combative war. Um, that won't get you anywhere. Could I follow up, Steve? Uh, yep. Yeah, I just want to, um, since I feel like I'm representing institutions that are that um, that that are slightly different, um, uh, I wanted to point out another don't, and that is for liberal arts colleges and and regional publics and small privates with heavy teaching loads and things. Um, when when you're making a case to upper administration, uh, don't make it strictly in terms of faculty or in terms of research, but always keep in mind the student and the impact on the student and make your case in, in, in those terms. Uh, how will, will what, you, what you want to do, how will it make education better for students? How will it make outcomes better for students? How will it help students progress through a degree uh, faster? How will it support student learning? So I would, uh, and I don't, I don't know because I don't have experience in, in R1 institutions. I don't know whether that case, you know, is the same at, uh, at Ben's and Joy's uh, institutions that, uh, with which they've been affiliated, but it certainly is the case in the, in the kinds of institutions where I've been an, an administrator. Ben, Joy, is that uh, different in your context or similar? I'll just chime in, students help a lot. Um, you know, ab, you know the, the core of the mission. So I, I, I absolutely agree um, uh, that, that that can be incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Joe. Nope, just going to second that. Totally agreed. Great. Um, so recognizing that department chairs are kind of in some ways in between um, the administrators and the faculty. Um, do you have advice for department chairs on recruiting allies, bringing faculty along in ways in which they can 
uh, play that role to be in a position to make the kinds of cases that you're suggesting? I'll say that it's an opportunity to experiment with some good collaborative leadership in the department. So um, if you have an initiative that maybe that you want to bring to the dean that that may be the case that some of your colleagues are very excited about it, most don't really care either way, a couple maybe are not so excited about it at all, um, being open about that in a departmental meeting and then asking for support and saying, you know, being, being frank about the level of support and uh, and how busy people are, but seeking to draw in graduate students, if, that, if that's relevant for you, if you have master's or doctoral students as in, into the conversation, if this is something that's going to benefit them, it can really help to ask them if, if it's not appropriate to bring them to the dean's meeting, at least to, to your prep meeting before you go. Um, and then uh, to, to try to, to share the burden and to say, look, if we all want to get this done, you know, we can share the work. That, that can be quite helpful in the kind of lead up to the interaction with the dean. Uh, Stephen, I just want to take this question up too, because uh, when you start to step outside of the department, there's some tremendous opportunities. And there's even opportunities to ideate uh, with your, your upper administrators. Um, so you may be and may historically be tethered to your unit, uh, to your department, and may have that as your, you know, that, that is your, that is your main universe. Uh, but you might approach your dean or your provost and say, look, I, I see potential here to intersect with other areas. Um, and so they can actually help you sometimes make, uh, do the, do the, uh, do the uh, switchboard operating. In fact, I, some, I, you know, I'm wearing this headphone for a reason because I see some of our roles as administrators as just being a switchboard operator, you know, connecting one with the other. I mean, that's, that's what I do, you know, 40% of my day is just making sure that people who need to be connected can be. And so, but you don't know who to connect if they're not coming to you with the idea. And uh, I always love to get a great idea um, and then try to build a connection. That's healthy for an institution. And it's healthy for the people in the department. They get to see a, a broader universe and they get to feel like they're participating in the life of an institution. It's a great thing. So thank you for that question. Um, there's, um, as a follow-up to that, one of the questions we've gotten through the Q&A um, involves how to deal with faculty who are uncomfortable with instrumentalist arguments for the humanities and really take pride in the uselessness of the humanities and kind of a humanities for humanity's sake framework. I, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to start on that because one of the things I've learned too in, in my role, and especially at a place like Case Western Reserve, is that there's a uselessness across the board in the STEM fields as well. They, they, they're arguing the same thing. I want to pursue this incredibly esoteric uh, um, idea for its own purity. Um, that, is the, that is the common ground because there's the common intellectual curiosity of scholars that can be built upon. It, it, it's, 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 it's the method. It's it's the it's the approaches. It, those are the those are the distinguishers and and the and the research terrain. Um, so um, obviously we're in higher education. We're all in some ways uh, pursuing that. Uh, our students are trying to tease out of all of those intellectual gymnastics that we're doing how that redounds upon their individual career paths and their aspirations. Um, but that's what a university is is the license of freedom to do. Um, regardless of field, and I see it as a great connector rather than a cleave. I, this is something I, I worry a lot about, um, and both at the MLA and I worried about it when I was a, a dean as well. Um, we obviously, faculty members uh, believe in the value of their uh, of pursuit of knowledge in their fields. That's why they're there. They, they believe that that it's worth knowing what it is they're pursuing. Um, and they want their students to be able to pursue that as well. Um, and they, they love what they're doing, but they also love their students, in, in my experience. Um, faculty members love their students and want good outcomes for their students. Um, and I think that it, it, it's a part of the function of a department chair in the humanities is to try to help faculty members in the humanities understand that it's not a compromise uh, of what they're teaching to arm their students to, uh, to graduate 
with a sense of the skills, the values, and the perspectives that they've that they've gained from studying what they've studied. So it's the it's it's the great challenge of the department chair in the humanities to uh, walk that tightrope for faculty members between what we do is workforce preparation and what we do is is strictly intellectual work. There's a middle ground that's about understanding the value of what we teach in our in our fields as um, as important for students to take with them after they graduate into their families into their communities and into their careers that it's not job training uh, but that it is preparation for something um, and that if we help faculty members identify what it's preparation for what it's valuable for um, then we've gone a long way toward um, making the, the uh, making a case that will allow uh, first gen students Pell Grant recipients students of color to major in our fields because they understand that they're not a dead end. Um, you know, they understand that they lead to a to to um, that there uh, uh, That there are jobs waiting, you know, uh, on the other on the other side. Now it's not it's not your job as a department chair to convince every single faculty member to go out and talk to you know industry leaders in your in your community and find out what courses you, they need to prepare their students for you know in order to get a job at such and such an industry that's not the job but there is a job um, that department chairs have to finesse uh, with departments that enable them to get students to be articulate about what it is they've learned and how they've learned to learn um, in, the, in the major. And again, this is something I worry all the time about. This is something we're working on in the career services area at the MLA on all the time, um, is treading that line between workforce preparation um, and, uh, and intellectual preparation and how, how can what we do be both. Um, I welcome anybody to talk to me about this, you know, outside of here because because um, this is front front of the mind all the time. Great. It's the right. same. I'll, I'll just say I, I worry about this all the time too. I mean, ACLS is is an organization devoted to to research, to scholarship, and and we're not primarily devoted to undergraduate pedagogy, but we're doing a lot of thinking about how um, how to open up our own mission, our own activities to acknowledge the wide variety of things that faculty do, um, including teaching and, and, and service to their departments. Uh, and I know people like other labels other than service. I'm just using it for shorthand. Um, but I'll say um, in terms of the going back to the nuts and bolts question, I, I want to imagine like the worst case where a faculty member gets really angry about talking about workforce competency or you know workforce preparation and um, and really takes it I mean not not being snobby not being a bad actor I mean just it really doesn't make sense to them they think of themselves as as handing on and they and they passionately love the task and responsibility of of handing on and um, um, knowledge opening up people's curiosities um, good teachers, people committed to the good of students. I, I, I'm really trying to think of the toughest case. I mean, there I, I've tried to take a line from Kathy Davidson and her writing about undergraduate education and um, and what she has said about the about the massive artificiality of the classroom and to remember what an unfamiliar and artificial environment it is for 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 humans, you know, for human beings. It doesn't have to be the way it is. Um, we could have very different kinds of classrooms and, and we could organize teaching very differently. We have the system we have where many people are working to improve it all the time. Um, but but while we're in the moment, understanding that for First, as Paula said, I just want to emphasize this for first gen students, for students whose high schools education, high school educations have not prepared them best for a college envir envir environment, um, for students who are suffering about, you know, from anxiety and find it difficult to speak up in groups. Uh, I mean, a whole variety of situations. Our, our job as teachers and, and as Paula said too, I think, and, and Ben, people care about their students. So to remind people that part of our responsibility as teachers is to is to understand where students are and that keep that the the mystery of unlocking humanistic wisdom which is so powerful and romantic and and real in the classroom in many moments has to be tempered or complemented with an understanding that what you consider unlocking the mystery will seem to many students as game playing or 
a real mystery, i.e. they just don't understand where you're coming from or what you want from them. And you're leaving them in the cold. So uh, I think that kind of conversation as a department chair and then conveying to the dean, going back to what we were talking about before, that you're having those conversations and you're really committed to opening up your, your colleagues' minds and making sure everyone's on the same page about this, it's going to get you uh, get you somewhere. In some places, it'll get you very far. Before, um, before I ask this next question, I want to invite every one who's, who's joining us today to enter questions in the Q&A function. And as we go about the conversation, we'll introduce um, those questions as they come through. Um, so one question that came in um, earlier that I think fits, fits with the current uh, context of the conversation is about gen ed requirements. This, of course, is where most of the students are going to meet the humanities for the first time. Um, so how can um, department chairs advocate for uh, including the humanities in gen ed requirements? I think one important kind of commitment to gen ed that we need to think about as a profession actually um, is devoting um, tenure line faculty energy to general education courses so that if we believe in the value of introductory level humanities courses uh, at well, we sh one, we should understand that if the major is the coin of the realm, um, that the way to, to the way to increase majors is is um, to use your tenure track faculty members to teach the, the the general ed courses because those are the faculty members who will be there when the student is a senior. Um, the institution is committed to those faculty members. They'll be there, they'll be available as advisors, they'll be available for follow-up. Right now, the horrible, horrible labor situation in most of our institutions means that, that we exploit part-time faculty members to teach the, the bulk of general education courses, certainly in the humanities and certainly in math. Um, and then students who fall in love with that discipline in that course never see that faculty member again because the institution is not committed to that faculty member and won't have that faculty member won't be teaching a, a higher level course might not be back the next semester so i think that one thing that we have to think about um, at, at the department level is how how general education fits with the major and how general education should be feeding the major um, and how uh, if if we don't advocate for for uh, strong general education requirements in our in our fields, um, then especially if our field is something like anthropology, which students haven't taken in high school and will never learn what it is um, to major in it, if there's not a way to take it in a general general education curriculum, um, that that a strong general education curriculum feeds majors in a, in a really, really important way. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question, but it raises some issues in relation to it anyway. Stephen, I, I'd like to take it up. Uh, this is a tough question uh, for obvious reasons. If there is ground for civil war at a university, it, 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 it is fought on the terrain and on the hill of, of, of general education. Um, and because there's so much at stake, um, uh, in terms of, you know, I, I think of the players, uh, you, you got your usual players, you, your College of Arts and Sciences and subdivided there, you, your STEM social sciences, then you've got your engineering, if you have the engineering school, uh, uh, you've got your business school, everyone's crowding in for a limited number of, of courses and it, it's, it can have a, a, a very, very serious effect on the fabric of an institution. My, uh, my out of the box pivot is to is to is to think about alumni and to think about industry um, because these are these are streams of individuals who are who recognize the impact oftentimes of these touches of of the of of the humanities 
in their lives um, at certain moments. Um, and in industry in particular, I've had now several conversations with, with corporations who are, who are craving. They say, yes, we know, again, I, I, a point that I said earlier, people are coming out with these technical competencies, but we want more. We want innovation. We want critical thinking. We, we want the things that we say we own in the humanities. Um, sometimes we have a little bit of trouble <laughs> mapping exactly what we do in our, in our fields to those, those skill sets, but we have that capacity and we, we say we own it. Um, those are those are your your allies that 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 can be very very instrumental and influential because I saw another question on the chat about board of boards of directors who may be hostile. Uh, these are these are the conduits that begin to crack the armor uh, a, a, against some of this uh, uh, some of this resistance um, and can that can influence the minds of your top administrators, which then can sh shepherd the battlefield uh, uh, you know situations in, in the middle of the civil war that is. Uh, uh, general education in many institutions. So you, you need those generals with the right flag. You need these, 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 these additional resources, these, these, uh, these additional uh, you know, uh, assets to, to help, help you in that fight. Um, here's a question that maybe best goes to Joy first. Um, how do you advocate for programs, faculty lines, et cetera, that deal with chronologically older periods um, such as, as classics. Um, it seems like cuts have fallen more on areas that deal with the pre-modern world. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a terrific question. I think building on what, what um, Ben and Paula just said, we have a, a lot of people, this is good news, a lot of people before us, including Paula and her colleagues at MLA, um, Jim Grossman and his colleagues at AHA, um, Helen Collier uh, and her colleagues at the Society of Classical Studies um, and, and a number of other associations I could name have um, have taken the lead and and sorry Steve I should have put you at the front of this list the National Humanities Alliance too has resources on their website that that are that will help you do the work of translating the kinds of skills and uh, and and curiosities, habits of mind that a liberal arts education, you know, all the fields in the humanities helps instill. Um, so you're not in it alone. You're not. You don't have to figure this all out yourself. I mean, and 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 uh, and uh, looking at those resources will help. I think in in terms, I have two big response. You know, two kind of um, five thousand feet up responses to the question about about pre modern. One is that. Um, as Hannah Arendt said, you know, the fundamental human condition is plurality. We're all different. People get turned on to ideas and to thinking. Uh, all you have to do is, for, for all kinds of reasons, and all you have to do is look at the internet and all the, you know, cult fan pages about, you know, the first season of Buffy or the fourth season of Buffy to see, you know, people get turned on to to thinking and to engagement and to intellectual communities for such a wide variety of reasons and to to reduce that diversity too much in any given school or any or or any given perspective of a faculty um, would be to deny that fundamental human reality and and so the pre-modern aspect of human experience is is you know falls right in that it captivates people for for all kinds of reasons some reasons that should be critiqued itself and and that become themselves an object of curiosity um, the other is um, is to think about traditions of to 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 tackle head on some of the contemporary issues in the world um, that we're facing, and I'll take um, race and racial inequality, racial injustice as one example, to, to fully understand the roots of those problems and different perspectives, alternatives, different ways of thinking. The, the past provides uh, not an infinite, but a very rich store of alternative modes of thinking. So I think the, those are two of the uh, powerful arguments that I've seen work with trustees, not not the super skeptics. There's going to be the 20 percent that just only want, you know, they, they're happy with the university that's graduating all business and computer science uh, and and biology graduates. But they're in the minority, and the majority will be swayed by uh, at least a bit by some version of these answers. And I follow up on that, Steve. I I just like to say that that that's a natural connection to the general education question as well, because in fact. Um, 
I mean, the best general education curricula I've seen have not been based in departments, you know, a requirement from this department or that field or that field, but, but that really understand that general education is an opportunity to have fields talk to each other. And, and that's where, um, especially in liberal arts colleges, but the, the early periods really shine, that, that folks who teach in fields that don't have a lot of majors, but that have a, a, a profound intellectual foundation for, you know, provide the foundation for everything else we do, can really set it up in the gen ed. Um, so that a general education curriculum that puts courses from different disciplines together, uh, that requires courses to talk to each other, you know, the stuff that Ben was talking about earlier, that links up that, that where the science courses are not over here by themselves, but they come to understand themselves in relation to the classics courses or, or language courses, or, you know, that a general education curriculum that sets students up to think in interdisciplinary ways is is probably you know the only thing that's going to save us in the long run because that reinforces um, for science majors or business majors um, th the absolute difference in thinking that you get from the humanities that helps you do the thinking in your discipline better um, that contextualizes it and that helps you be better at whatever thing you choose so I feel like gen ed is actually is really really important to what to what we're talking about. And I don't think anybody has, has, uh, has hit it um, exactly, but I think if you go to Purdue and look at that cornerstone project there that, that the Teagle Foundation is now giving you some grants to, to go and take a look at, go to teagle.org and, and look for their general ed uh, curriculum uh, project that they've got going on right now. Apply for some funds from them to think about your gen, gen ed curriculum in the way that, that this Cornerstone project has done. I think it's one, one way uh, at this. I want to make sure we get to this crisis scenario. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure your advice overlaps with things you've been saying already, but what, what if a department does find itself in a crisis and is on the chopping block, either for elimination or a steep reduction. What what should what should a department chair do in that situation? You know, I, this this is a hard question, and um, you know, unfortunately, a, lo a lot of units do face this. Um, I think there are a couple of things w one can do. None of none of this may save you, but it may change. You know, it, it may it may alter the fate. And I see there's a question on prioritization um, here as well, uh, which looks like you know sometimes you know, that's that's one step in this process um, when the numbers don't don't line up to getting to to the end of the road, um, so to speak. So uh, let's let's pretend like, like you said we're at the end. What what, what can you do? Um, sometimes you, you've been you've been you've been making the case alone. Um, sometimes uh, you, you need deans and provosts. They they like to to listen in stereo and 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 what. But that, what I mean by that is hearing it from multiple angles. And, and, and so the more you're able to kind of get other voices into the conversation about your story and understanding, you know, your, your situation, that can be helpful um, by no means, by no means uh, completely uh, uh, effective, but it, it, it's a strategy. Also, usually in these situations, there are going to be some yards uh, given to you. Take, take the yards that, that exist. I'm using the football metaphor. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe, there's a, maybe there's on the table the possibility for, uh, for fusion with another unit. Um, uh, maybe there's the possibility for exploring a, a second life in a different iteration. Um, maybe it, it means um, uh, conjoining with, uh, with, uh, with, with a different college uh, in some ways. Um, figure out what, what that play, what those yards are. And again, I'm, 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 I'm at the very end here. I'm, I'm assuming that you're on the block and it, the blade is coming. Um, what can you do? Um, don't, you don't have to take it uh, necessarily, but look for your afterlife. Write and try to write your own script when possible. This is, this is, uh, this is truly important. Sit down at the table, marshal the allies and figure out, you know, what, what are the terms? And uh, uh, sometimes one creative possibility in this world, and especially I think more at, at Publix now, we're seeing this in, in the Pennsylvania system, you know, think about breathing your life in, in terms of with 
can connect it with other institutions um, uh, outside of your own. Uh, uh, so imagine a classics department, uh, and I hate because I was a classics, you know, <laughs> I took classics as an undergraduate, but I just, you know, it just happens to be, you know, take that classics department. What, what would you look like if you were then conjoined with, you know, Penn State, uh, you know, Princeton and some other, uh, some other places in some way uh, that can, cr that creates a different altered fate that, that could be, that could, that could be very useful uh, uh, to an institution and an institution that can see value where it may not have. Um, so um, if you're on the chopping block, the blade is coming. Those are some thoughts, uh, thoughts from under the, uh, under the guillotine. I, I, I want to reiterate what Ben is saying in terms of, um, of finding your allies and, and trying to be proactive uh, when, you, when you're looking up and seeing it coming. Um, in my area, um, this happens with modern languages all the time. I mean, we used to have departments of Italian, departments of French, departments of Spanish. Now we have departments of romance literature, departments of modern languages. Um, the, the, the ways to save the teaching of your field at all, you know, if not all the lines in it, um, look out for er creating area studies, creating language and culture departments, you know, m merging with theater and doing performance study. You know, there, there are ways of doing that, but also, um, in a state college system, for example, I was in Massachusetts, and one of the things that we were exploring was, you know, my college had Japanese. Other state colleges that were the equivalent of mine in, in, in the state didn't have Japanese, you know, but we didn't have enough Japanese majors to keep that line. So opening up online courses to the, uh, to the rest of the system so that we could have the enrollments in Japanese, and then seeing, oh, they, they they teach a lot of Arabic over there. Our students could get access to Arabic. So thinking, you know, concretely about ways that you can make links with other institutions as well as well as other departments. Actually, I, I think I want to second all these comments um, from my two colleagues and say that I wish uh, that departments had this kind of conversation on a more regular basis anyway. I mean, kind of for their own self-critical self-understanding and their own creativity you know to that question of like okay we've always done things this way or we've done the things this way for a number of decades but what are we missing by doing them that way we might do them a different way and um and it can be healthy uh for i think really deeply healthy and exciting and and revitalizing especially for graduate students these days if you're in a department with doctoral students they're going to be so nervous about what's coming at them in terms of the academic job market and i think as faculty especially if you're tenure track or tenured to show the graduate students that you're leading the, the way and thinking creatively about a new shape to the field that might give more opportunities to them it really will put heart into them and it may be intellectually really exciting um, so i think um, those conversations about reconfigurations are, are good and i'll add one more uh, in language and literature departments i've heard about some interesting experiments blending kind of one room schoolhouse approach um, and using peer learning to blend uh, advanced language learning with um, with with intermediate and uh, with all the research showing that students to our maybe to our horror or dismay uh, or smiles, um, students learn quite well from each other in in moderate amounts when you know when supervised. So making use of peer to peer learning and mentoring um, in a in a context like that can get your numbers up when it comes to intermediate and advanced languages and and again show some initiative and creativity for the administration, which they're always looking for in their colleagues. Couple of last questions. Um, so kind of a follow-up to this um, conversation about reduction and when you're close to the guillotine, um, what strategies could be explored when a department is facing reduction, but um, the reduction leaves the department without some of its most dynamic faculty who were more recent hires? Um, how can you revitalize a department in that situation? Steve, I, I want to make sure I'm hearing. So some of the stars are gone. Yeah, so it's, it's the question is with, with seniority in higher education, some of the recent hires who are um, filling 
uh, roles that are are more relevant to contemporary questions um, might might not be there due to reductions. So I'll start, uh, and this this depends on your administrator, but. There are options uh, in in the visiting uh, professorship lecturership um, uh, sphere in which you can, you know, you can basically get yourself a patch, um, and, and so um, individuals can come and uh, energize your unit uh, from outside for for a time, um, and maybe it's it's a. Uh, you know, maybe we're, it's working with good friends at the ACLS or or, uh, or some other institution um, uh, uh, to 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 figure out a, a pathway for for a uh, distinguished uh, visitor uh, to to help illuminate and validate in some ways what what what's possible. Um, and so, looking for those looking for those kind of important patches uh, that can that can provide. Um, a, a, a kind of a caffeine boost for, for a department and, and a critical moment is, is, is a useful strategy and can be a low budget strategy and also can be something, this is one thing I forgot to mention under, from under the guillotine is to look toward development. Um, look, look for those friends. This is the time, guys. Uh, if there was ever the donor who was your, you know, who, who was the person who was your angel, uh, who went to your unit, find them. Uh, this is the time to call on them. Might be the time for that fifty thousand dollar gift uh, that could get you a distinguished visitor, uh, partnering with your u university to to give you that critical patch to buy you time in order to reinvigorate your unit. Um, think think in terms of lifelines, lifelines. Um, so a last question, um, uh, are there, how can department chairs connect with each other? Are there networks of department chairs, um, that bring them together for capacity building? I think I'll, Paula, if you. So that can happen, um, in discipline or, or outside, and certainly your college that you're a part of should should have regular occasions for, for the chairs to meet with each other and strategize. And if you only do that with your dean, that's a mistake. Uh, try to set up some meetings without the dean in the room as well. Um, but your disciplinary association um, should have ways that you can get together with other chairs in your discipline. Certainly the MLA, you know, has the Association of Departments of English and the Association of Departments of Foreign Languages that bring together um, chairs for professional development reasons. And there's a listserv that's very active where people are sharing strategies. We have summer seminars where people have workshops together on how to deal with this or that or the other thing. I know the AHA has new chairs training. Um, most scholarly societies, I Joy put no better than I uh, do, would have, have ways of getting you in touch with other other chairs in your in your field. But certainly, if you're in languages, folklore, literature, linguistics, um, uh, the MLA has has regular uh, connection every day, every week uh, amongst chairs to share ideas. Yeah, Paul is right, and and if you uh, are if if you don't know, uh, go to your go to your discipline's website and and find out, and don't hesitate to contact the executive director of your of your society of your relevant society or interdisciplinary area to uh, to, to express interest in this. And if it doesn't exist, you know, um, you might get together some colleagues at, from from grad school and a bunch of other you know who are have posts at other universities and and get it started uh it doesn't take much it's usually like a listserv and a couple maybe these days a zoom meeting here or there uh and it's uh as paula said these meetings with chairs in your institution or across institutions without administrators in the room sharing strategies are hugely important great thanks so much uh to ben joy and paula and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, we also have resources related to these issues at, uh, on our website, nhalliance.org and studythehumanities.org. We'll be sending a link to the recording of this webinar in our next memo to members. And please email us if you have ideas for future calls. Thanks again.